We are carrying on with our same multiple choice paper. So this is the um, May, June 2018 paper 11. We've got already through questions one to eight. So we're carrying on from question nine today. Next topics, let's see what we get. So question nine tells us that phospholipids and triglycerides are important biological molecules. Which properties are correct for these molecules? Okay, so phospholipids and triglycerides. We're talking two different kinds of lipids. And we're asking you now about polarity, who is nonpolar, and we're also asking about hydrophobic, who is partially hydrophobic. So remember, polar and nonpolar, that also links into hydrophobic, hydrophilic, because water is polar. So if you are nonpolar, then you are going to be hydrophobic. If you're polar, you're going to be hydrophilic, which is same like water. So if we think about phospholipids and triglycerides, our nonpolar one is the triglyceride, because a phospholipid has a polar head, that phosphate group. Partially hydrophobic implies also that we have partially hydrophilic, which means then our phospholipid. So we look now for the line that has triglyceride on the left, phospholipid on the right, and we see, there we go, our answer is C. So question 10. Diagrams show two arrangements of amino acids in a protein. Okay, so amino acids in a protein. Which row correctly names the bonds at S or T? So we need to look nicely. I need to say, okay, here we have loops. Okay, and here we have zigzags. And we should then be thinking about, okay, let's see. Arrangements of amino acids in a protein. So we have a few, we have primary, we have secondary, we have tertiary. We also have our quaternary structure, but that's something different, okay? That's then we'd be needing to consider different um, polypeptides or a um, prosthetic group, neither of which we have here. So we're dealing here with primary, secondary, tertiary. If we were looking at primary, we'd just be looking at the peptide bonds, covalent bonds from one to the next, okay? If we were looking at secondary structure, here we'd be looking at our beta fetid sheet or our alpha helix. Now you should be thinking, oh, hold on, there's something going on here. This is sounding like it might be rather applicable here. Tertiary, remember, is when we take our polypeptide chain and we scramble it all up with all sorts of different bonds. So actually, when we look at this, this looks rather like an alpha helix and a beta fetid sheet. And that key thing about that secondary structure, it's all based on hydrogen bonds. Okay, so if we say now we look at here, we've got ionic bonds or hydrogen bonds, this is secondary structure. So we have no ionic bonds. We have hydrogen bonds at both. So our answer then is A. The structure bonding that we're looking at here is hydrogen bonds for S and T because we're looking at alpha helix and our beta helix sheet. So from lipids to proteins, next we get amino acids. So students were asked to highlight only the R groups of two ring-shaped amino acids. Which pair of diagrams are correct for both amino acids? Goodness gracious me. This is something very different, hey? We've never done ring-shaped amino acids, but we've got some basic skills and understanding that's going to help us do this. Okay, so if we think of our basic amino acid, we have N, C, C, double bond O, single bond O, H, and then the N gets to H's, we have an R group and we have an H. So the R group that we're looking for would be 
this guy here. Okay, but obviously things are going to look a little bit different because now we have ring-shaped amino acids. Okay, but what we need to know is this core sort of skeleton, this NCC, of course, that is still going to be unshaded. Okay, so anybody who shaded that backbone of the amino acid, we could call it, is going to be wrong. So what we want to do, we want to look at these and say, where do we find our NCC? So here in A, here's our C double bond O, C, N. So there's our NCC. And here he is here. So both of these ones are wrong because we have shading on that backbone. If we look at the next option, there's our backbone and there's our backbone. So again, they're wrong. The next option, there's our backbone. And there's our backbone. So these ones are actually like upside down from the way we drew it here. See here, there's a free H on the bottom, whereas here we're getting this free H on the top. In fact, in all of them, the R group has been drawn at the bottom rather than on the top. But now we've crossed out A, B, and C, so we're hoping that D is correct. Otherwise, we've gone squonk somewhere. So the backbone here is, again, NCC, NCC. So thankfully, there was a student that got it right. So we have our NCC, our C double one O. See, we've lost the H from here, so we've got an O minus. We've gained an H here, so we've got an NH3 plus. But we've still got that same core structure. And the R group is the piece that's separated and shaded correctly in here. So it's not just about being able to draw a basic amino acid you've really got to understand you know what is the difference of my r group and have that flexibility in your mind that you can apply this knowledge into a completely different question because every now and then they can throw them in and it gets to be a bit more fun and games so what's next we're moving from proteins onto enzymes which words from the table correctly complete the paragraph about enzymes. When the pH of an environment is decreased below the optimum pH of an enzyme, something bonds between adjacent something groups holding the something structure are disrupted. Okay, so what are we looking for? What kind of bonds are going to be disrupted by our changing pH? Well, change in pH is a change in your hydrogen ions. So change in pH is a change in charge. So any bond that is a charge-based bond is going to be disrupted. So who are our charge-based bonds? They are our hydrogen bonds our ionic bonds. Because peptide are a type of covalent, um, disulfide are a type of covalent, so all of these other non-charge base sharing electrons, then they're not going to be affected in the same way by a change in pH. So the ones we're focusing on, one should be hydrogen and ionic. Oh look, there we go, hydrogen and ionic. Adjacent definitely between R groups, okay, and holding the tertiary structure are disrupted. So there would be also some potential disruption of your secondary structure because your secondary structure, remember, is based on your hydrogen bond, charge-based bond. But there is no option here for secondary and tertiary. So we are looking then just for option A, hydrogen and ionic, ion groups and tertiary. Okay, obviously anything with a peptide would be on. And so we doing the tertiary structure for this one. Okay. So, next one. 13, the effect of substrate concentration on an enzyme catalyzed reaction was measured in three different conditions. No inhibitor, competitive inhibitor, and non-competitive inhibitor. The graph shows the results. We have rate of reaction against substrate concentration, enzyme with none, inhibitor X and inhibitor Y. Which statement is correct? 
Now, before we even get into which statement is correct, we want to know who is who. So we have to think between X and Y. One is competitive, one is non-competitive. And they have two very different shapes. And we need to think, okay, so which of these two inhibitor types is going to have less of an effect when substrate concentration is increased? Okay, and that is, of course, when we're changing substrate concentration, we are changing competition. So inhibitor X is our competitive. Inhibitor, inhibitor Y is our non-competitive. So now we can think in our minds, you know, competitive is temporary bonds at the active site, non-competitive is anywhere else, or permanent bonds at the active site. So we need to think through, okay, what have we got? X is a competitive inhibitor, yeah, we like that, which binds to a site other than the active site. No, that's wrong. Competitive binds to active sites. X is a non-competitive, that's wrong. Y is a competitive, that's wrong. Okay, so fingers crossed for that last option again. Y is a non-competitive, yep. Binds to a site other than the active site, that is perfectly possible. So D is our option for question 13. So it's quite important that you've got your head around the information in the question before you go and try to take apart all these answers where there's so many words involved. So yeah, the, the, the comments come up that they're good at tricking us, and yes, they are. They do like to put twisty things in there that cause you to, to take a wobble or two, and it'll be one or two little words that are different so that can catch you out. So the more words in a multiple choice question, be careful. So moving from enzymes onto cell membranes. Which statements about the cell surface membrane are correct? So we need to think in our mind about the membrane and what's going on. And then we need to look at these. Okay, so channel proteins allow water soluble ions and molecules across the membrane. Well, that's true because these things can't get across the, the membrane because of that hydrophobic region. So channel proteins, yes, they do allow things across. In particular, hydrophilic substances. Glucose can pass into the cell via carrier proteins. Well, that's true. Okay, glucose is not going to diffuse across. It has to be carried across. Oxygen passes freely through the membrane as it is soluble in lipids. Yes, oxygen passes through diffusion. So we're kind of happy that it's going straight through the membrane and it's not getting stopped by that phospholipid bilayer. So it doesn't need proteins. It can go straight through. Last one, some glycoproteins act as antigens. So carbohydrate chain stuck on a protein. And antigens are our cell markers involved in cell recognition, self and non-self, if you've got all the way to immunity already. So this is most definitely true. We've ticked all four of them. So our answer is A. One, two, three, and four. And when we do this confidently, we don't even need to check the other ones because we know for sure that all of these statements are correct. So question 15. Which of these features increase the efficiency of iron uptake by a root hair cell. Okay, so we're not just thinking about active transport here. We're thinking about the efficiency of the active transport. Remember your root hair cells are those special cells in the roots on the edge with the long extensions for their increasing surface area to increase osmosis and active transport. Okay, so active transport requires energy, so having many mitochondria in the cell, definitely, that will increase efficiency. High concentration of ions in the vacuole. That's not going to affect the efficiency of active transport. High concentration is going to affect efficiency if we are looking at diffusion or something going out, but that's not what we're looking at here. So that one's wrong. And then, 
protein carriers in the cell surface membrane, well, definitely we need those carriers if we're going to have iron uptake. The more carriers we have, the more efficiency we have. So that one definitely affects efficiency. So our answer is then one and three only. Number 16, what can increase the fluidity of a cell surface membrane at low temperatures? Okay, so remember when we talk about saturation and we talk about cholesterol and we talk about fluidity, we always give it in terms of they can regulate the fluidity because it can have opposite effects at different temperatures. So if we want to increase fluidity, double bonds between carbon atoms in the fatty acid chains, definitely. Because remember, if we don't have any double bonds, our fatty acids sit in a zigzag together, right? If we put in a double bond, we get kinks. And we can get kinks at different points, and that then means that those chains can't stick so closely together. So that definitely increases fluidity. Cholesterol is regulating fluidity because it brings down fluidity at high temperature and up fluidity at low temperature. So cholesterol definitely increases fluidity. Fatty acids having shorter chains. Well, if we think about it, this versus this, this one is much more fluid because it doesn't have that length of stability. If you put just your fingertips together versus your whole hand together, you've got a lot more fluidity with just your fingertips. So the less distance we have there for connection, then the more fluidity we have. So all three of these factors would actually increase the fluidity. So answer is A, one, two, and three. We would increase fluidity by having double bonds, cholesterol, and short chains for the fatty acids. So you can see that we're also sort of following the pattern of your syllabus as we work through these papers. They are nice and reliable. So now we move from cell membranes onto cells. So the diagrams show the shape and size of two types of cell. We have a palisade mesophile cell and a columnar epithelial cell. Okay, so the palisade mesophile is 10 by 10 by 50 with a surface area of 2200 micrometers squared. The columnar epithelial is 10 by 5 by 45 with a volume of 2250. The question asks, which statement is correct about the palisade cell and the epithelial cell shown in the diagrams? Okay, so we have the surface area and we have the volume. So we're talking here, we're going somewhere along the lines of surface area and volume and comparison of impacts of these. Okay, so, an increase in surface area reduces the distance for gases to reach the surface center of the cell. Okay. The surface area of the palisade mesophile cell is 500 micrometers squared greater than the columnar epithelial cell. The surface area to volume ratio is greater in the columnar epithelial cell than the palisade mesophile cell. And the volume of the palisade mesophile cell is 325 100 micrometers cubed greater than that of a columnar epithelial cell. So obviously, we are not going to be able to go any further in this unless we get some more numbers. So we need now the volume of the palisade mesophile. So volume, remember, is surface area of one side times the third dimension. So 10 by 10 gives us 100 times 50 would give us 5,000 micrometers cubed. That's the volume here. Okay, so we can already see that D is knocked out because that volume is not 25 greater, it's 2750 greater. So that's wrong. Surface area of our columnar epithelial is 10 by, five, ooh, 10 by 5 by 2, so we would have 50 by 2, there's our two ends, right? We would have 
45 by 5. Five by five by two to get these two sides. So we've got the ends and the two sides. And then we need the faces. So that's 10 by 45. So that's 450 by two. So that equals 900. That equals 100. And this equals two times five is 10 times 45 is 450. So here our surface area is 1,400 and 50 micrometers squared. Right, so now we are ready. The surface area of the palisade cell is 500 micrometers squared greater than the columnar epithelial. 2200 minus 500 is not 1450, so that's wrong. So the difference is between A and C. An increase in surface area reduces the distance for gases to reach the center of the cell. It just, just sounds weird, okay? And then the surface area to volume ratio is greater in the columnar epithelial than in the palisade mesophyll. So surface area to volume. So we would want 2200 over 5000. That's surface area to volume here. And here, 1450 over 2250. So 22 over 50. Now these are things I'm not going to do in my head, so let's grab a calculator quickly. So 22 over 50 gives us 0 0.44 and 145 divided by 225 gives us 0.64. So, surface area to volume ratio of 0.64 is definitely bigger. So C is correct. So if we think about A, it's all going to be a little bit more furry than that, okay? So increasing surface area doesn't always reduce the distance for gases to reach the center of a cell. Um, because it's all dependent actually on that surface area to volume ratio. So C we are definitely sure about, and it is definitely correct, and it definitely makes sense. So that is the one that we are seeking for. So whenever you see surface area and volume, you want to think in terms of that ratio. And whenever you see an applied question, you want to really stick to the application. So we're moving from cells into something slightly different. A student observed the cells in the growing region, the meristem, of an onion root and obtained the data shown. Interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. So now we've moved into mitosis. So mitosis is PMAT. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And interphase are the cells that are just going about doing their job, growing, functioning, they're not actually actively dividing. Okay, mitosis, when we get into the nuclear division, that's when we get prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. So, which percentage of cells contains chromosomes that appear as two chromatids? So, we are looking now at. Remember, our chromosome is going to replicate to have two chromatids. And then those two chromatids are going to divide. So metaphase, they are going, so prophase, this is what they're going to look like. Metaphase, they're going to line up. Anaphase, now they're going to split. And telophase, they'll be in wobbles. So anaphase and telophase will not have those two chromatids. So have a think. About what you're looking at. So let's get all our total number of cells. Our total number of cells would be 886 
plus 73 plus 16 plus 14 plus 11, giving us a thousand cells. Okay, so we have a total of a thousand cells. So, how many of these have the two chromatids? If we consider that full interface, remember that replication is only going to happen toward the end. So any cell at the beginning of interface, we can't say is in this doubled up. So those ones we also have to knock out because we're not given detail on the specific phases of interface. When we left then with prophase and metaphase, what we've established then definitely prophase and metaphase are our doubles. So we take our 73 plus our 16, that gives us a total of 89 cells. So 89 divided by 1000 times 100 is going to give us 8.9. So the ones that are definitely in that two chromatids is B. Seems like I can't write and speak at the same time. 8.9. So B is our answer. 8.9%. So here you've got to have a good understanding of what's going on in interface. But you've got your G1, your S and G2, but we don't have any further details. And because some of those are single chromosomes, then we can't say that they are all double chromosomes. Prophase and metaphase, those are definitely appearing as two chromosomes for one chromosome. Sticking with mitosis, which of these events are part of mitosis? So we're carrying on quite nicely from our discussion with the previous question. So we've already said interphase is not part of mitosis. Remember, if you think of your cell cycle, you've got your mitosis, then you've got your G1, your S, and your G2, and these are all interphase. So interphase is not. Telophase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, most definitely. Cytokinesis. Now, cytokinesis is when our cell splits into two. Mitosis is just our nuclear division. So, cytokinesis, when that cell splits, is separate. So, the only event that is part of mitosis is telophase is two, is D2 only. So just because the next one is also so tightly linked into this topic of mitosis, during which phase of the cell cycle does DNA replication take place? Well, G1 is for growth, S is for replication, G2 is for checking. So our S phase, our interphase, is when our DNA replication takes place.